Well, very good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Daniel Tyler. I'm the Vice Master of Trinity Hall. Uh, and I'm really delighted to welcome you all to the uh, second annual Social Innovation Lecture delivered in partnership between Trinity Hall and the Cambridge Centre for Social Innovation. This lecture is part of a broad programme of support for entrepreneurs at Trinity Hall, made possible by a donation from our alumnus and honorary fellow, Graham Ross Russell. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Graham for his very generous support. We're pleased to be able to partner with the Centre for Social Innovation and thank them and the Alumni and Development Office team at Trinity Hall for organising this event and thank the Judge Business School for hosting. And it's now my pleasure to introduce and hand over to Maro Guillen. Uh, Professor Guillen is Dean of the Cambridge Judge Business School, which he joined in 2021. He's Professor of Management Studies and a Fellow of Queen's College. Thank you so much, Daniel. Thank you very much. And it is my honor today to uh, welcome to our school, not for the first time, uh, Professor Johanna Amer, whom I've known for maybe I don't know, two years, right, uh, times ten or something, uh, for a very long time. And uh, she is going to uh, be uh, sharing with us today her thoughts and her analysis of how to blend innovation and scaling for successful social uh, innovation. Um, she is also a uh, fellow at the Stanford Center on Philanthropy and Civil Society, in addition to a professor at the Hertie School uh, in Berlin. Uh, thank you very much uh, for coming and that's also affiliated with, uh, with Harvard. And as you know, her research uh, deals with uh, novel ways of approaching social innovation involving organizations, involving networks, uh, and uh, she has done uh, really path-breaking um, empirical work, uh, qualitative empirical work on all of these uh, uh, dynamics. And uh, she has published a number of articles, and uh, I guess uh, most relevant to this uh, presentation today is her 2017 book uh, called Innovation and Scaling for social uh, impact, which I highly uh, recommend, um, in which uh, you know I think she uh, debunks some of the big myths that exist out there as to uh, the um, you know possibilities for improving the state of the world through social innovation. Uh, so it's a truly wonderful, uh, wonderful book. Uh, so today is, as uh, Daniel mentioned, uh, the second annual lecture, and I do want to um, you know reciprocate the uh, the nice words that you said before about our collaboration between uh, Claire, um, I'm sorry, Trinity Call and uh, the school. Uh, this is exactly what we want to do here at Cambridge Judge Business School, which is to build bridges with other parts of the university, as well as with, of course, universities and scholars in other parts of the world. Uh, so without further ado, those are the instructions that I had. So I have to confess that I think uh, Jen here is also playing some role, but it's not in my notes. Uh, and I just got here today from the US. So I'm going to let you, Jen, uh, explain exactly what your role here is. I think as a moderator, correct? Uh, Jen grenville who is um, a professor here in the school. Thank you so much. And uh, Johanna, welcome again. here assembled, and especially for Johanna for joining us from Berlin, and I think many of us have missed the opportunity to engage in person with each other. Um, as mentioned, you are a great friend of many of us here. I've used your work in teaching our social innovation students. Um, I'm both a professor here at the Business School and a fellow of Trinity Hall, and um, it's delightful to be hosting this event. I know there are a number of people who are joining us online, and so we will have an opportunity for questions. We'll have a conversation for about 45 minutes or so um, where Johanna will tell us about the main content and motivation and, and uh, insights from her book, and then questions about anything that's been said or anything that's on your mind, please send them in. So those of you who are online, you have the link, and I will be monitoring those questions and will also obviously take questions from our live audience in the room. So, Johanna, you, you and Christian Silos co-authored your book in 2017. A copy of it is sitting here. It was um, published by Stanford University Press. It's won many awards. But the real motivation for it, as I understand, was based on your experience of many decades studying largely organizations in the global south, very successful organizations that had made social impact. But I think you wanted to debunk some myths about 
how you make social impact and what the role of innovation is within those. So what really was going on when you thought about, when you oriented to writing this book? What was your motivation? What was your idea that you needed to get across? Right, so uh, it, as you rightly said, Jen, uh, the, the book is based on 15 years of extensive field work and, and really working with organizations that, that address deeply entrenched uh, societal challenges and have done so over three decades. And we were very fortunate to work with these organizations uh, for so long, for 15 years, which means that they really opened up to us. Um, and we often thought like, how can we give back? You know, we write our papers, we produce our scholarship, we use that in the classroom, and yet there, you're always left with something like, how can we give back? And we, we didn't really know how to and, until uh, the Rockefeller Foundation approached us at, at Stanford at our research lab, Gill, and they asked us, Christian and Johanna, can you help us to, to unpack continuous innovation? We would like the, the organization we support to continuously innovate. And we s thought like, hmm, how do we make sense of that? And we thought, do we really have a, a deep reflection on what is the role of innovation to create impact? So that was a first uh, um, trigger, if you, if you will. Uh, the second trigger for us to, to write this book was really an observation that we have, have had for, for, de for a decade. Uh, and the observation was the following. Foundations typically gave money to organizations when they demonstrate we are going to innovate, no? So basically, you, you put innovation in your grant proposal and your chances to get the funding increases by, I don't know, 400%. The second uh, uh, was like uh, uh, funders, for some reason, love scaling. No? And so, but, you know, there are these two elements, innovation and scaling, that funders like and fund separately. And the question for us is how can we, from the perspective of one organization, think about how they relate to each other? How does innovation relate to scaling? So that was the second trigger question for us. So these two, two questions really um, motivated us to go back to the rich material that we have collected over 15 years. But that alone also does not necessarily justify writing a book. Because all of, all of you who have written a book uh, know how, you know, it's a deep commitment. So there was a third trigger. And the third trigger was an observation uh, that we have um, also, you know, uh, that re repeated itself over the decade, being very much out in the field of practice, but then, um, uh, and the, the observation is the following. We realized that funders that very generously support uh, 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 social enterprises, social uh, organization in general, um, you know, they, they are well intended and they have very capable people working for them. But we realize they often do not really understand the organizational realities and the local realities of, of the context where the organizations matter. And it has to do that, you know, the organizations are often reluctant to tell the funders everything, right? They open that uh, up to us and told us what doesn't work, but they do not necessarily tell the, the funders what doesn't work, no? So we realize there is a potential gap uh, between, you know, the, the understanding of funders and, and the knowledge, the deep knowledge that resides with the organization who carried out the work, have failed to have successes. And we wanted to, to write a book that connects this. So the book is, is for funders and for, uh, for the organizations, for social enterprises. And we had this ambition to, to write a book that um, really takes advantage of the stock of knowledge we as a community and generation of scholarship has created and at the same time is very much practical and useful. Mm -hmm. So that was a little bit the, the ambition that we had. Um, and so the book is standing on the shoulders of, of, of knowledge, not only research that we have done, but you know, really 
um, uh, literature in sociology and anthropology uh, and so on. Um, and at the same time has some very practical tools and we call them diagnostics that everyone can use, everyone who, who, who um, that everyone can use to also reflect with people in their organizations on. So there were really three, uh, three triggers for us to, to, um, to write this book. Yeah, yeah. And what's really interesting is it's won awards both through our Academy of Management, our sort of scholarly field, but also from a more practical audience. That's so right, clearly yeah. it hit its mark. Um, so that's wonderful to hear about what you were facing when you were thinking about it. I think also what's interesting to me is, you know, again, informed a little bit by the entrepreneurship model and being somewhat at the heart of Silicon Valley, at least in, in one of your many roles, um, innovation and scaling can be taken as fundamentally good and you sort of open them up and question uh, mm -hmm. their goodness, especially in this setting. So maybe at the outset we should just have you define, as you do so well in the book, what do you mean by innovation and how do you discern that from scaling? How do we need to think of those two terms um, independently and, like you said, ultimately together? Yeah, so, so the first thing that is important to understand that the book is from the perspective of an, of an organization that actually does the work. You know? And the second important uh, point is to understand we look at innovation as a process. So the, the innovation as a process that, gets f f that runs from the uh, generation of an idea, developing the idea further, to actually uh, struggling within the, the organization to make sure that we carry this out, to potentially a solution. And the scaling part actually is the part that actually takes an effective uh, product uh, or solution and tries to reach as many, um, many people as possible, but also tries to constantly improve the quality of the product and service. So basically it's a quantity and the quality argument. And for us the important point was to again make sure that, um, that our readers understand how they, these two processes hang together in an organization. And as you uh, probably can immediately see is sometimes, you know, in an organization you have people that, that love innovation uh, because the innovation is the sexy part. But the, the, the blood, sweat and tear work of scaling, doing the same thing over and over, mm -hmm. that is often, uh, um, you know, not the sexy part and yet mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the scaling part is actually the important bit one because innovation per se doesn't create impact. Innovation is wasteful, uh, it, uh, it uh, consumes uh, all types of resources, money, emotions and so on. I d in, a, in the best case, an uh, innovation leads to, has the potential to a solution. But it's the scaling that actually gets you from an investment to impact. And once you understand that innovation and scaling have to hang together, you also are much more likely to understand or see pathologies. What are pathologies? Pathologies are those factors in an organization that derail you from a productive path from innovation to scaling mm -hmm. and therefore to impact. Such Pathologies can be that some organization never gets started with innovation. Some, uh, because you know, they are just doing what they have been doing all the time or because it's simply not in their DNA. Or other pathologies are if you have a, a founder that just loves to innovate and uh, she uh, comes to the office every morning with thousands of ideas. Uh, you know, but that really derails you from never really getting to the scaling part. Mm -hmm. And you don't really create impact. You lo uh, leave a lot of impact on the table. So there are different, um, uh, different pathologies that we, generic pathologies that we work out. And it's exactly this pathology diagnostic that every organization can use and reflect on their own journey from innovation to scaling. So that's fantastic. Maybe also it's important to, to sort of point out, which was a learning for me actually, um, in, in using your material in teaching again and just engaging with it. 
you know, many times we think, well, innovation is fine because we can fail and we can learn, but why is that particularly risky in some social settings and in settings where social impact is being sought? Why is it incorrect to take this innovation fail fast model from Silicon Valley and apply it into settings that you studied? I don't think that we should apply it. Uh, quite the opposite. So uh, one important feature that we work or emphasize in the book about innovation is that uh, innovation is, is a process that where you have to deal with all sorts of uncertainty. Uh, and, you know, it could be the problem frame. Do you have the right problem frame? One of the organizations that, that we studied for, for 15 years, Gumbrikas, they, uh, they, uh, they uh, do water and sanitation, if you will, you know. But is the lack of, of, of toilets, is, open def is that a, a, a technical problem because we don't have really uh, good enough toilets as the... Uh, Gates Foundation for years has developed uh, or has offered uh, challenges on developing the, the latest uh, type of, of toilet. Or is it uh, uh, deeply entrenched in religion and cultural norms problem? Because open defecation is really embedded in the, in the religious uh, terms. Mm -hmm. so, the, the, so what innovation basically does is that uh, it, it requires you to deal with these uh, uncertainties. Uh, and um, the, as you go forward, you also learn and, and can reduce such uncertainties. But the problem with uh, uh, in adopting or implementing uh, the idea of, of a fail and fail fast in the social sector is that with every intervention, with every innovation, you basically leave a legacy. It's not like the next chip that, you know, just, okay, it didn't work and you create a new chip. You, with every intervention in a community or so, you leave a legacy and that can be often very detrimental. Mm -hmm. So very often, for example, in, if I may use again the sanitation example and the organization that we studied, it's about water and sanitation, but it works with the, with the community because the ultimate goal is, is actually altering deeply entrenched patterns of inequality. So it, the water and sanitation is an entry point for them into the village to really work with them on inequality issues. But the problem for the organization is, is if a neighboring village gets a toilet for free while they ask the whole village to work together and do something, people uh, like villagers would say, well, we want to get it for free. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of, 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 of uh, legacy effects that, uh, that we need to deal with. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I often say, like, we, uh, we need innovation because we have to clean up the, the, the things that didn't work in the first one. So we have to be careful about innovation for the sake of innovation. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. But nevertheless, innovation is, is really an important um, element because it also constitutes an, a learning opportunity. Yeah. So I think um, that's helpful to think about in that way. And I, uh, one of the things that we can reflect on is how innovation you know, failing fast in a resource-rich environment where the consequences are not that dire. I mean, there might be economic consequences, technological consequences, but you're not dealing with human lives and livelihoods. Exactly. And you're not leaving a legacy of failed innovation or intervention that will mm -hmm. lead to lack of trust, et cetera. So I think yet another reason why these commonly used words, especially around innovation and scaling, just don't translate to new contexts. Um, so the next question I wanted us to, to focus on is actually um, this, this conceptualization or the, 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 the fact that you point out that actually the context really matters, the people really matter, the nature of the problems really matter. And as you've just illustrated, a question around sanitation actually is embedded in a whole lot of other deep assumptions and understandings that aren't necessarily obvious um, mm -hmm. and that will change from not necessarily one village to the next, but certainly from one region or country to the next. So what are the different ways, what are the key messages in the book about the multiple pathways to innovation or scaling and how the two come together? So you've said a little bit about Graham Vickers. What are the other pathways that, that organizations that you studied have successfully mm -hmm. gone on? 
So for the book, we, we decided to focus on four of the organizations we were able to collaborate with, also because they represent four different archetypes of how innovation and scaling hang together. And it's important uh, to, to, uh, to stress that there is not one best way how, uh, how innovation and scaling hang together. It has to do with the context. It has to do with the problem that you address. And obviously, it, it has to do with the people. Who are the people who do things that that matters greatly, you know? And and uh, we talked about uh, Gramvika's um, other um, archetypes. For example, would be uh, the Arvind Eye Hospital, the uh, the eye hospital in in India that does um, with a mission of preventing uh, needless blindness. And the number one source of needless blindness is cataract surgery. So this is an organization that got started uh, after Dr. V retired. He was an ophthalmologist, and, and after he retired, he started this, um, this uh, social enterprise, if you, if you want to call it that way. So here, the interesting thing is that the innovation per se, the, the surgery, uh, happened obviously before the organization was built. And Aravind is often claimed for being so innovative, and and so and and you know our analysis actually points to, um, uh, uh, you know, point gets to a different conclusion. It's very good at scaling, and it does innovate whenever they face a bottleneck of not doing enough surgeries. Then they innovate. So it's really f uh, about. Uh, finding a bottleneck and fix it. So for example, in the early years, they were, uh, it was easy for them to get the intraocular lenses from companies. Johnson & Johnson would, would give them intraocular lenses. Uh, you know, as you all know, uh, businesses at some point all might also think about, whoa, they are really getting big and we cannot really afford so many. Uh, intraocular lenses. So what did uh, Aravind do? They decided to uh, build a plant. You know, um, they became a manufacturing uh, uh, manufacturer of intraocular lenses. And at some point, I think they are number three in the world now, manufacturer. Same as you know, to to again the scaling, increasing the reach. You cannot build a hospital in every. Uh, uh, you cannot build 10 hospitals in, in Tamil Nadu, but you want to reach people in rural villages. So also here, you innovate around community organizing so that you check patients in their villages and those that need surgery, you bring them uh, to the hospital. So that's another archetype. BRAC, the largest NGO in the world, um, starting out of, of Bangladesh, now operating in multiple countries countries and especially in Africa, uh, they focus on transforming the life in the earlier days, especially the life of women. And around that, uh, they basically innovate with uh, all the things that they, they uncover that, that uh, women need, you know, education, health, human rights, and so on. And the last uh, um, archetype that I uh, wanted to um, a share is the w Waste Concern. It's an organization that was founded by two entrepreneurs, also in Bangladesh, who had made it very clear, we don't want to become as big as, as Brock, right? We are entrepreneurs. So what they do, they turn waste into a resource and um, develop a fertilizer out of that and develop uh, all type of new ideas and technologies around waste. So what they do, is that they um, develop uh, the solution, they tinker with it, but then they also put a, a patent around it. Now, here the patent is not necessarily to capture the value, but the patent helps them uh, to allow others to scale it better because they have to scale it in a certain specific way. And so there are different archetypes of, of how innovation hangs together. The important thing is that reflects on their own archetype. Mm -hmm. So um, those in themselves show different ways of weaving innovation and scaling. And I always like the Arvin's, the Arvin's Eye Hospital one because I think in the book you refer to it as, you know, they're doing a stunningly routine surgery. And so actually innovating on that process, on that surgery, 
is not the point. And so sometimes, as you say, as an organizational scholar, you have an organizational lens on what works, what doesn't, mm -hmm. what are the bottlenecks, and how do we get around those. So w two of the phrases that you use, if you don't know how to learn, don't innovate, and if you don't know how to scale, don't innovate. Is there anything else that you'd like to unpack around that, um, um. around that connection? And what have you seen organizations get wrong in terms of their learning? So the, in a, I think that the, the sentence, if you don't know how to learn, don't innovate, is an important one. And it has to also, goes back to also uh, Jim March's work that we also uh, use quite a bit in, in, in the book. And as I mentioned before, um, innovation is very much a, a process where you need to deal with uncertainty. Innovation is a, is a process where a lot of things go wrong. So if you think about, again, innovation as a process, it's like a roller coaster. You think you have an idea, but the idea is not as good as you think. Well, perhaps if you really rethink it, it's a good idea. And you, you're going to try it out, but damn it, the field trial didn't work, right? But hey, there might be a, a twist and turn. We get some funding. Wow, we can really make this happen. And then, you know, some other things work. It's a roller coaster. Now, this is hard for people to go through that, especially in, in you know, if you think about a social problem, you really make this work. It's hard, so it, you easily can get setbacks, especially funders retreat. But if you look at innovation as this roller coaster and look at innovation as a learning, what have we learned? Have we learned something about these, these, these uncertainties that I uh, was uh, uh, trying to, to get to? In the book we talk about six, but there are more. Do we have the right problem frame? The, the, will, will actually the beneficiaries adopt the solution? These are all uh, spaces where you learn a lot while you innovate. So at the, if, you, if you turn your mindset into, you know, do I fail or do I succeed into a learning, uh, uh, look at innovation processes from a learning uh, lens, it helps you to be motivated but it also helps you to become much better at, uh, at uh, innovation and, and uh, in the long run. So 2017, the book was published, which I know means that you started writing it well before then. And you, of course, studied these organizations, all four, for well more than a decade. So there's a lot that goes into that book. But I think since then, we would all agree that the conversation, just the, the, the sort of frequency with which we hear the word social impact and social innovation or social entrepreneurship being talked about has only increased mm -hmm. in, in the five years since the book was published. Um, we have lots of for-profit organizations getting explicitly into the game, whereas the organizations that you tended to study were nonprofits funded in the more traditional way. So bring us up to date. What's happened in the last five years that, that you think is still exciting and relevant, or are there any developments you think maybe this isn't the way we want to be going? Is innovation still learning? Is innovation and scaling still understood with the nuance that you bring to it? Or are there developments that you're a little cautious about or more hopeful about? Mm -hmm. I think uh, innovation, I think most, most uh, players, if you will, uh, would uh, not necessarily think of innovation as the holy grail anymore. And I think there's much a deeper understanding of what it takes to create social impact. Um, I think what also is, is uh, very helpful that uh, social innovation as a, as a practice is now also a, a topic that is not just, you know, confined to the space of social enterprise but it's, uh, it's in, the, in the private sector, and most of all, it's also become, again, uh, an important topic in the public sector. Um, it's interesting as social innovation in the, in the public sector uh, also is like a roller coaster. I remember when uh, Barack Obama uh, inaugurated the first uh, office of social innovation, and, and uh, you know, it was well intended, but it, it has as a scheme, again, like 
just a very simple matching uh, fund scheme, which was limi it's limited, but it's a start. Uh, but uh, as a result, in Latin America, we had almost every country set up a, a, an office of, of social innovation, each country with a specific focus on what they meant by that. But then, uh, as we all know, uh, uh, when, when, when Trump was elected, social innovation was not a topic anymore. And um, it soon like disappeared also on the agenda of many other governments. And over the last five years, actually, we have, have a, a resurgence of it. And what is even more ex uh, exciting is that it's, um, it's a nice, uh, uh, it's actually um, many different trends come together. So the social economy, if I want, uh, 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 can use that term, uh, is basically, um, seeing a revival. It's especially a policymaker in the, in the European Union, but also in Latin America with a solidarity economy. And it's, it's the first time actually we see many different um, uh, agenda setters like the OECD, the EU, uh, even the British Council, the, the, uh, coming together and really seeing this as an opportunity really to push the needle. What I think is also um, uh, a trend in these last five years, and I'm looking at Ali because he has also seen that uh, in, a, in a place like Germany where you wouldn't expect it, all of a sudden uh, social innovation becomes a matter of collective action that really is, 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 is becoming um, something that uh, penetrates society uh, more generally. So I would say that the next... 10 years certainly will be a de uh, 10 years of, of more of a collective action mm -hmm. approach in social innovation. And I think that's exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and um, any other trends that we see? Um, How about um, business? I mean, because we increasingly see new forms, absolutely. new organizational forms, absolutely. ways in which businesses are having a social I as well as financial mission. And should we? Should Absolutely. we get excited about that? I, I, thought, I thought we are in a business school and, and those trends are all well received, especially as you have wonderful colleagues such as mm -hmm. Chris, who is an expert on also the, the, the movements around the B Corps mm -hmm. and uh, you know, the concept that Mohammed Yunus uh, coined years back, social business has found its way in multiple manifestations now. And also in your area, sustainability, mm -hmm. obviously a lot has happened. Um, again, I personally do not see um, the, the trends in business as decoupled from trends in the public sector, and this is really the exciting part as well, that um, the, um, what we previously or what we for decades called non-market strategies, and I'm looking at, at Mauro, it's, it's, it, they are market strategies. Now they are, so we cannot uh, uh, think um, about business without, um, uh, without the public sector. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, the, the social sector is always the, uh, the, the element that actually holds accountable both uh, the private and the public sector. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's uh, from that part, I'm, I'm really excited about the progress that we have made. Uh, the question now is to what extent um, the, the social uh, organization are considered really at eye level. And it was also uh, exciting to see how the social enterprises that I encountered 20 years ago when I, I started to, to engage more with the field of practice, they have now formed their own collective action part and they really want to be heard and they mobilize. And uh, that's really exciting to yeah, see. Yeah. So these are all, you know, and, and need, need we say that, you know, coming out of the pandemic, we've seen all sorts of pathologies um, associated with the ways that we have been organizing and the, and the separations that we have had between these sectors, despite the recognition that they need to work together. And I guess it remains to be seen how much people will pick up on these ideas. Um, and, you know, we, we hear of the sort of build back better and all of this. And, and the question I think again there is, do we want to innovate or do we want to learn from 
what has not worked in mm -hmm. the past and, and you know, kind of try new, new variations on the same. You've written as well recently about systems change, not, 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 not that you know, social innovation and social impact wasn't a big enough issue to tackle, but now tackling systems change and you've got some really interesting and exciting work around that also reflecting on some of the same organizations. Um, and I think you argue that part of systems change is very similar to innovation, which is it's dealing with uncertainty, but it's also dealing with uncertainty on different scales and in ways that we don't necessarily see. And frankly, we don't train our students. And in general, we're not oriented to think about systems. So what are the things, if you can give a, just a few moments, and then we'll turn to your questions, so keep them coming if you're online. Um, what are the things about systems change that we need to adopt and learn in order to move forward in this new era that we're in? I think there are two parts of, of, of this uh, question, Jen. One thing is like system perspective, thinking in terms of system. I think we would all agree that that's important, right? That, that without that, I think we are also not educating our uh, students or prepare them to really see the the, the interconnectedness of, of social problems, but also aspects in, in life. Mm -hmm. um, but then there is also the other element, and this is what Christian and I more picked up, and, and what we often do is we, we observe the field of practice, uh, and then we try to understand where we do we think we go overboard, or we might go into, you know, too fast in a direction where we would basically say, hey, a uh, timeout. And we observed like five or six years ago that there was an obsession by funders to invest or support systems change. In other, in other words, like we will support you not just if you innovate or if you scale, but no, you have now to uh, change entire systems, then we will fund you. And that's uh, quite a stretch, no? And, and so the, the point is that we wanted to scratch the surface of um, of this, the you know, what do people mean by systems change? Because if you really then ask funders, what do you mean by systems change? The answers were actually not very solid, right? So this is again like the the approach that we have at Gill, uh, and this is mainly Christian's work, like really uh, going over decades of 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 um, uh, different perspectives on on systems change, and mm -hmm. and we realized, you know, there was a great excitement uh, about 50 years ago about systems in all disciplines. Mm -hmm. Everyone was just talking about systems. In the 80s, then it it really faded away, mm -hmm. uh, and now all of a sudden funders and everyone want to to, to do systems change, and we try to uh, again we are scholars and we try to put our tools at hand and um, we wrote a few few articles around that and and also try to educate uh, uh, funders to to uh, be more um, more reflective of what they mean uh, because uh, again as you rightly said uh, if you think about s uh, an organization changing a system it's again with a lot of uncertainties you know? And you don't know what you what you um, uh, what you set in motion, and then who deals with that? No. So I think the the systems change uh, conversation is someone that I'm also particularly excited uh, to put forward in our uh, more scholarly domain because there are uh, uh, in especially in organization and management uh, theory we have quite a bit of of. Uh, um, uh, legacy and trajectory on that, but uh, the the real message here is we should not be carried away by labels and terms, mm -hmm. and really uh, try to reflect what what do we mean by that. So just like innovation and scaling aren't fundamentally good, neither is systems change. And I think actually one of the pieces that you wrote in the Stanford Social Innovation Review shortly after the book came out on systems, you you pointed that out, that actually systems are dynamic. They're changing already. Exactly. It's actually how can we direct, or it's very hard to direct a system. How do you draw towards a subsystem that is actually functional and working, which again is sort of this learning and, and, and um, 
demonstration-based uh, To be very trajectory. provocative, we would argue that there, there exists no system in, in, in the world. No? If, you, if you are two people in, in a room, you are already a system. No? And systems change all the time. So do you, do you have a particular direction that you want to change a, a system yeah. to? And, and yeah, these are the questions. Yeah, yeah, great. So I think at this point I would love to get questions from the room. So if anyone has a question in the audience, um, raise your hand. You will get a microphone. And I'm going to take a moment to hop online and check out what's coming in um, on the virtual channel. So um, Nicole is standing by. and I. I I don't know, Neil, that looked like a question. <laughs> Not picking on you, Neil, but. Is it on? Excellent. Thank you so much. That was, that was really fascinating. Um, I just wondered, you talked a bit about the problematization of innovation, but can you talk any more about scaling, uh, the problematization of scaling? Like, is there ever um, examples you have of when actually scaling is the wrong thing to do and, and things should stay small? So again, uh, you can uh, remain small as an organization and still scale. So for example, race concern, it's not they don't, don't do much of the scaling themselves, but yet they need to understand how the scaling works. So in the book, we, we differentiate between red zone and green zone. The red zone is when you're in, 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 in the innovation mode and the green zone is in the scaling mode. So the reason why scaling is important is because through scaling, you really tinker with the solution that came out of an innovation process. You tinker with it, but you also learn much more about the, the people that are affected by the solution. And you learn much more about the context where your, your solution is actually implemented. So basically, by deeply engaging with the people and with the context, you learn so much that you, your next round of innovation will be much more productive. Now, scaling is, is really fundamental for innovation. Uh, I give you an example, Gramvitas, the organization that I mentioned, they started out as a student group. They, you know, they, they had good intentions to change inequality in, um, in Orissa, in Odisha. Uh, that was not their state, they came from uh, uh, Kerala. But they started out with land irrigation because there was funding available for land irrigation. They thought, ha, we give farmer uh, irrigation, uh, for, uh, land holders, and we say, we irrigate your land, and in return, you share the harvest with uh, the farmers who didn't own the land. You can imagine what happened. Land was irrigated, and the land holder, the, the holders uh, kept, the, uh, kept the money. You know? So again, but they learned about the power structures in, uh, uh, that are locally. Next round of uh, iteration, they thought, wow, the most, uh, the, the, the communities suffering most from inequality are tribal villages. They, you know, they are really in remote places. Uh, the trend then was uh, dairy. Let's bring dairy to those uh, today's communities. Dairy is nutritious, it gives you a livelihood. Well, they figured out nobody drinks or touches cows in those villages. No? So again, they learned much more about the local realities and the people. What do you do with dung? You do biogas. So they, they actually, next iteration was doing biogas. Uh, uh, initiatives in, in India. They were super successful. They scaled out to 5,000 villages. They were the poster child of Indian biogas. But they stepped back and said, biogas, we are successful in scaling, but do we do really tackle inequality? They were brave enough to say, we are stopping biogas, we are divesting it, we do a spin-off, and we go back uh, to the drawing table, but they learned so much about these villages. They learned that every village wants clean water. No village wants toilet. So they thought we do uh, water and sanitation. Water, because clean water, running water, everyone wants. We couple that with sanitation in order to address the problem of open defecation. But we really get to work with the village, and we only work with the village if 100% of the village is on board, which means that lower caste, higher caste, rich 
uh, 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 poor uh, men, women, they all need to work together. And that really got them going to address inequality. The villages was working on the, on the water and sanitation project. And, but in the, in the background, you know, the, uh, addressing inequality was what they are really after. So what I'm trying to say is, without the biogas, they would have never, without the scaling in the biogas, they would have never learned so much in order to actually come to this next round of innovation of water and sanitation. So this is why scaling is important, because you really, really understand people and context much better. So there's a question that's related that has come in from someone online. Um, so Tuan, I'm, I'm going to change your question slightly, but we'll get there. Um, the story that you've just unpacked is one that's very interesting because it also says this organization was able to detect mission drift and capture it, right? So they could have been great at scaling biogas, but actually they didn't that's really right. ultimately, mm -hmm. and they reminded themselves and they were self-reflective. So we've got a question here about someone who's doing quantitative research. So you're a qualitative researcher, you deeply understand the context, you understand the limits of scaling, you understand what's learned by scaling and how that's applied. What are kind of proxies for scaling that a quantitative researcher might use? And I guess to be really provocative, is it even possible to create effective proxies for scaling or innovation that quantitative researchers can use to study these kinds of problems? I almost think it's easier for, uh, for uh, scaling because you can uh, use proxies like how many uh, villages uh, you uh, use. You can find proxies for, the, uh, for even the quality of a, a product and, and service. Um, I think it's possible. It's probably yeah. easier for scaling than, than yeah. for innovation. Yeah. I guess by innovation, I mean people do measure innovation quantitatively, yeah. but if you treat innovation as a process yeah. inherently as you yeah. do, and if you yeah. talk about innovation as sort of uncovering and dealing with uncertainty, then um, so Chuan, good luck to you because we need both quantitative and qualitative research on this, but it, it shows the strengths of the different methods, mm -hmm. doesn't it, and the complementarity. Um, other questions from here in our audience? Am I? Oh, there we are. Thank you. Uh, I think it's a really, really interesting discussion and very pertinent to some of the things that my organisation is working on. I'm just conscious about the mention of the date of 2017, which is, of course, prior to quite a significant event has affected us all uh, in the uh, recent years. And in, in that time, we've seen that innovation and scaling had to happen at the same time. You can, organisations had to respond very quickly to everything that was going on. But what lessons do you think we can take from that period that are positive with regards to innovation and scaling that we don't need, an in, in a, uh, don't need a pandemic to help us do the next time? What positives can we take from all of this? Uh, positives from, from, the, from the pandemic. I think the pandemic in, in, in different ways have, has exposed uh, many, if I may use the word again, pathologies in, in in our systems, if I may use that term now. And um, I, I would hope that we um, would take uh, the opportunity and fix some of those, those pathologies. Um, uh, but um, it seems that, you know, we are just going from one crisis to another, you know? And, and so you, you might hope that after the, the uh, the pandemic, we will have the time for reflection and fix some of the problems that are so obvious. And yet another, another crisis hits, and in our case, it's the Ukraine. Um, so um, I, I honestly think that we, we have to rethink how we add also, we have to rethink also education, no? Uh, education in professional schools, being a business school like Judge or being a public policy school uh, as Hertie, because I'm afraid we will not get out of this crisis after crisis mode. No? So the, 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 the challenge is really how do we, um, how do we rejuvenate or how do we uh, fix some problems in our system? And I think it's, it's not 
by means of social innovation, but we, would, we ha really have to become better is institutional innovation. And that's hard because we are so used to just let a system burn down and then build it up. And we are not really good in, in rejuvenate the institutions that, that uh, make our society and economy. And I think that is, ha should be the explicit effort of us also educators, and I'm including myself here. So how can we get better in, in, in helping those decision makers to really early enough uh, rejuvenate or uh, twist and, uh, some of their system that we don't have to run down a system? Mm -hmm. But that's hard, and I have no, don't have the solution yet. So I'm not catching your name, but if I can follow on, and then we'll get the question at the back here. Um, you know, there's a lot that's come out, especially with the pandemic and a lot of reflections, and I think the other trend that we see is um, the exchange of information, data, you know, rapid sort of gathering and dissemination and sharing, which I think was one of the things that enabled us to understand the virus and the treatments and everything so quickly. So when you think about your experiences with very localized, you know, sort of settings in which you needed to, maybe once you understood one village and the dynamics deeply enough, then you, then you could, then you could replicate the approach in different villages. But now we're in an information rich environment where things can be shared, both for positive and for negative. Does that help? Does that, does that, is that some of the solution to how we might, as the question was posed, sort of couple scaling and innovation more rapidly and effectively? Or are we fooling ourselves that data is going to save us on? So this and other things. <laughs> data, data and the way we use data um, is certainly also uh, super helpful in, in the Global South and the intervention and most of the organization that I mentioned obviously are, are using uh, data uh, very effectively. At the same time, uh, it's, it's always a question like who owns the data? No, and um, what, what do we do with the data? So I think that's, um, or who is allowed to do what with the data, let's put it this way. No, and I think that's uh, yet another example why I think uh, we just need to uh, let go of the idea that there's a private sector and there's a public sector and there's a social sector. No, mm -hmm. I mean, it, I, I deeply believe that we have to have a division of labor, no, in the public and the, and the private. But in a way, it's not anymore the ma it's not anymore uh, the business of just one sector. Mm -hmm. And this is why we uh, have to also, in a way, educate the next generation of, of decision makers and leaders in a way that they understand the, 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 the mindset, the mandate, fundamental mandate of the other side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We'll get to the question. Yeah, your question. Thank you. Um, please say your name if you're happy to um, and introduce yourself. Sorry, <laughs> we didn't get that opportunity Thank earlier. you, Jennifer. Thank you, Joanna. This is Emily from Social Innovation um, Master Degree Study. So um, you mentioned that one of the purpose of the book is to fill the gap between the founder, the knowledge, um, how they understand about the social innovation and uh, to the reality. And also, I do agree one of your papers that the innovation is not the holy grail. And you did, you did also mention it is uh, rolling. You know, we learned from you know the mistake, or then we come back again. And I do agree. So, on the one hand, I wonder, once the founder, either they read your book or they realize the reality, are they lose their confidence, or they're more confident they would like to you know willing to change it? That's the first question. And the second one is. Uh, Internally, I know some social uh, entrepreneur, or the social enterprise, that take maybe decades, you know, like you, you're starting you know, 15 years um, to learn those mistakes. So far, is there any good platform, apart from those uh, you know, literature or books, uh, to share, to maximize the value where they learned to other social entrepreneurs? So yeah, there's two questions, mm -hmm. external and internal, mm -hmm. thank you. 
Let me uh, use uh, uh, the, the second question as a segue to, to, my, uh, to my additional role. I'm also the academic editor of Stanford Social Innovation Review. And Stanford Social Innovation Review, really, uh, we consider ourselves as a platform that, that um, allows the, the collective learning in the field of practice, but also of a, as a repository of ideas. So we curate content. We, we basically curate content that is written by practitioners and scholars. And, and Chris and, and Jen both have also written for us. So in a way, that's also a little bit of a, a repository of knowledge and a place where funders and social enterprises and scholars meet. And that creates a, a very productive set of, of knowledge. And I think there are a, a number of repositories now out there that, that try to share that, uh, you know, also all major, uh, I don't know about the social innovation uh, 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 center here, but all major universities that have a social innovation center that also try to, to get that. We have one at, at, at Stanford, for example. Let me get to your first question and, and, and uh, what's new on the, the more the funder uh, uh, landscape. And that's also quite interesting to observe. And again, um, it, um, it also is often a, a very uh, US-centric conversation or European conversation. So just allow me just to reflect on general trends. So I think there is uh, quite a bit of awareness among funders and philanthropic uh, organization uh, that they have to shift gears. There's, there are separate individual movements in that space. One that I particularly like is the trust-based uh, philanthropy that really takes seriously uh, um, the, the grantees that might also then take grantees into the governance governance system of the foundation. That's an interesting trend. Um, uh, in the US at times, I think we also might go a little bit overboard at the moment. Uh, the largest number of submissions uh, we get at SSR deal with um, bashing every single practice we have done in uh, on strategic philanthropy and effective philanthropy, the way we do due diligence, the way you do this. It's basically under the spirit of uh, decolonization. And so I think it's an important voice and, and spirit. I don't think that we necessarily need, need to throw out every practice that uh, we have, but uh, critical interrogate and reflect on that is certainly useful. And there are other contexts uh, that uh, on philanthropy that are so much basically occupied by themselves that, uh, that, that hardly any see any need for change. So uh, again, philanthropy is, um, is, uh, uh, is not just this one field, but it's so fragmented and, and also again, depending uh, on, on also the institutional context. For example, in Germany, it's a very institutionalized, it's a very, um, a very stiff and, 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 and hard to move type of field uh, that doesn't necessarily uh, have so many mavericks or deviants, such as, for example, in the US. You might not always like also, uh, you know, the, the way of how uh, uh, philanthropies act and, and, and do things, but at the same time, it's also they bring in new ideas and, and remind us to reflect, or even the, they trigger some voices, no? and that's also good. So I think it's, a, it's an interesting time for philanthropy, a lot of things going on, actually. That's great. So we have a question from online from Drew. So Drew, type it in if you need to clarify, but Drew is interested to hear what you, Joanna, believe will be the biggest challenges in the development of social businesses in the next few years. So switching from the philanthropy <laughs> challenges and maybe yeah. we should say fads and fashions and dimensions. Um, what are the biggest challenges in the development of social business? Yeah, I think it's we have much more uh, qualified people in the room to to uh, to answer that question. I would love to also hear from from Chris uh, about that. Um, I think for me, it's um, it's still um, the the ability or the willingness of, of for example, company 
to, uh, to get rid of a specific glass ceiling when it comes down to careers within companies that, um, that allow managers that work in a social business in the company to also uh, really make it up to the top. Mm -hmm. I think there is still a proof of concept uh, that uh, companies need to deliver yeah. And uh, Mao and I uh, often meet in Davos, and it's always striking how how um, how CEOs talk as as their companies would be social businesses, no? But still, I think the uh, the proof is in the pudding, and to to see a career path within companies. Uh, that uh, do not necessarily discriminate whether you had a career in the social business part of your, your company or others, that I think would be one, one thing I would look yeah. forward to. So you're thinking about large businesses where there's, there are certain things that they're doing, but it's not core, it's not mainstream. Yeah, it's sort it was of like 20 years yeah. ago, it was the, the CSR department. Now it's typically called something around social yeah. business. No? But, yeah. uh, so I think that development is a really good one because it connects you closer to the, to the core yeah. of the company. But I, th I, I think it's still, um, in many places, it's still um, not necessarily uh, looked at as it was mainstream. Sure. Yeah. yeah, no, exactly. I think that's. But again, that's I might not be as qualified as others here yeah. in the room yeah. to talk about this. Any any comments from the audience on on that question? Chris, Chris since Chris. you were singled out. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, sort of diversity broadly speaking, is a huge um, area where I think companies say a lot, but they actually don't do a lot. And I think that my answer to the question would be, you know, around that sort of, in some ways, greenwashing. You know, company. You know, it's very popular nowadays to say, you know, we're, you know, focused on ESG or you know DEI, but actually, if you look inside the company it's not clear that that's actually being implemented. So I think the biggest challenge is uh, around holding companies accountable for meeting what they say, and how to actually do that is a very complex um, complex challenge. Mm -hmm. I guess I, I have a reflection on, you know, the sort of the ecosystem, because if we, as you said earlier, different sectors do different things and we need them to do different things for accountability and, and effectiveness and whatnot. But on the other hand, we see a lot of demonstrations and a lot of movement around things. So we have a lot of social businesses or B corporations or you know, mission-driven organizations that might have in the past set themselves up as purely a social enterprise, but now they're setting themselves up as a business in some form. Mm -hmm. So. Does that give you hope? Are they the ones who are going to demonstrate and push and hold bigger yes. business accountable or demonstrate other ways? Or are they just hopping on the bandwagon of you know, what used to be just good old fashioned nonprofit work and making it sound sexy? No, I think it's a, it's a trend that will stay and, and that's good mm -hmm. because it's not anymore that we have five social businesses and then they're all bought up by, you know, Ben and Jerry's or, or Burt's Bee and, and then, you know, yeah. you never hear from them. Now I think we have this critical mass mm -hmm. of, of companies that are born social mm -hmm. and that also uh, will remain social because obviously also lots has changed also on the on the uh, on the finance on the investor side, no, and I think that's really important, and this is why why I think it's 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 a, it's a trend that uh, you right right to use the term ecosystem because you cannot look at this without also having the, the finance and the investor side, but I think there is now much more also. Um, uh, awareness of investors, mm -hmm. uh, not only uh, because they want to do good, because it's also and it's the right thing to do, but it's because it's also the future and mm -hmm. therefore it's um, profitable. Yeah, yeah. It's the future as long as we look far enough. Yeah, and every <laughs> I, probably out of ten, out of ten entrepreneurs, eight of them already think social in in when they. Mm. think about a business idea, no? I, yeah, I yeah. think it's a matter of time. Yeah, it's yeah. 
the next generation, um, or that's now, it's now. Um, so Anjan online has a question, and it might be semantics. Um, systems change and in institutional entrepreneurship, are these two somehow linked? I think it would, would take a while to unpack also the systems change uh, aspect again. Um, institutional entrepreneurs is, is also, institutional entrepreneur is a label that we uh, use also widely in the literature. Um, yeah, you can, you can relate the two if you will, but it, it really depends on how you use them as, as concepts. Mm -hmm. Now, we, we often fall in love with concepts without necessarily reflecting uh, how they manifest in the real world. So um, I think that's um, important uh, yeah. that we don't fall in love with our own uh, uh, terms and concepts because then we are able to speak to each other in our little communities but not necessarily to, yeah. uh, to the real world. I certainly think that systems change and systems thinking has much more resonance out there in the world of institutional entrepreneurship, but it's actually it kind of makes me reflect, you know, as someone who's been in this field for a while too, and also in an editorial position, we as scholars can reinvent labels for the same thing over and over again sometimes. And um, so I think it, it, we really do need to hold ourselves accountable of what does that actually show up like in the real world? Are we describing phenomena with a new label? You know, systems are yeah. cool now, so we'll call this a systems exactly. change problem rather than an institutional change problem. Um, and, and actually is that the good work? Be very work careful. Is, yeah, 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 so I that's, agree. that's great. Um, uh, other questions, we have a couple more minutes for questions and then I have a closing question or two for Joanna. Anyone who's got something that they need to know? <laughs> yeah, please. on a social innovation project at the moment and I just wanted to ask you about an observation that I made about how deeply political is social innovation? And what is the solution to this? <laughs> oh, that's a good one. <laughs> deeply political, um, it, it, uh, you know, again, you would have need to unpack the political part in your case, because I, I'm with you. I would also see a lot of political uh, aspects in it, but it could be uh, the, the politics uh, that relate to uh, the relationship with those that support you uh, and uh, the organization, or it could be, and that's the, the more exciting part that, uh, that I'm also looking into in my own research, uh, the, the, uh, the really political aspect when it comes down to address a, so a societal problem or a social problem the, in, in the context of where the problem resides. Because every social problem that we address uh, has also someone who should take care of it. And many of the, uh, the problems we address are, should you might want to think like in the mandate of the public sector. And therefore, if you really want to address or, or scale, address a social problem in its, in its you know, comprehensiveness, you cannot shy away from that political uh, aspect. And uh, that's actually one of the, 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 the aspects of my work that I'm really excited about, really to unpack these political aspects. Also, if you think about uh, the, the different repertoire, we, we do far too little work on that, on, the, on, the, on the, the levers of change uh, that a social enterprise can have. You, know, you can think about levers of change or, or, or strategies of change, of changing the behavior and attitudes of, of people as an organization. But at the same time, also uh, try to really do something at this more political system and change a particular law that is very detrimental for uh, for making progress on the on the social problem. Or you can also think about more the lobbying part and really influence policy making. And it's this this influencing policy making that I think we are in a much better. A place today realizing that social enterprises are really part of that 
and you know we have together with colleagues we have we are uh, observing more than a thousand social enterprises in nine different countries and influencing policy is certainly something that that all social enterprises also are aware that we have to do you know, 10 years ago 15 years ago funders would, would really like social enterprises just to focus on this particular problem. And these political aspects were blanked out. I think today we are in a much better position. And also the assertiveness of social enterprises that also we, are, we don't shy away from actually being part of the political game. That I really observe over and over, and I think it's a good trend. Mm -hmm. So another question is coming from Irina on the um, on the virtual audience, um, adding another dimension to the ecosystem. And this reflects our first um, uh, social innovation lecture last year, which was with Sir Bonnie Cohen, who has written a great deal about and done a great deal on impact investing. So as impact investors are entering this whole ecosystem, is that having an effect? How is it going to shift? What is their leverage or added value in, in as we think about innovation and scaling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, impact investors uh, certainly uh, are um, uh, an important element, an important actor in this field of practice. Um, I had the, the, the great or have the great opportunity to work on impact investing with my friend and colleague Lisa Heenberger and we were able to observe the evolution of impact investing, especially in, in, in Europe over, over 20 years. And it's, it's really striking also how they manage to, impact investing managed to really have a big share of the, 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 the discourse in social innovation, although until very recently they were actually very small in terms of actually the, the money we are talking about no. Um, and so the, the, the money or the, the, the really lever for, if you want to call it systems change, is certainly not in impact investing and it's much more in the social finance part, which is the mains, you know, getting really into mainstream finance. Mm -hmm. And I think perhaps one of the merits of impact investing it was also that to, to trigger that conversation and it has then spillover effects to mainstream finance. So in that yeah. sense, yes, it, it's, it's very helpful. Um, I think there is also a lot of, of learning going on in the impact investing uh, scene, but what is, was always uh, striking for me uh, uh, to, uh, to see is how there are a number of, of organizations who really lead the field, and they were initially really saying, we want to create impact, and they became more humble and saw, well, we can also not really measure impact, so let's stay with measuring out outputs or outcomes. Yet, newer ones entering the field, they, they were caught by these big ambitions to measure impact. No? So it's, it's an interesting uh, field of, of practice to observe where you have clearly some, some thought leaders and, 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 and others that follow. But again, my main point is that impact investing will not be the game changer. It has to be mainstream finance. Mm -hmm. So again, this question of scale, but also yeah. innovation, right? And yeah. the demonstration yeah. Yeah. Um, that it's possible or the, or the push for more mainstream organizations to get involved might be actually uh, yeah. a significant because it's, point. So. There's, you know, the, the, the financial system in general, doesn't really um, have a place for social enterprises. Again, if I may come back to our data on these one, more than a thousand uh, social enterprises, if you look at their sources of liquidity and their sources of finance, almost no one can rely on loans because regular banks, they are not equipped to give a, a loan to, to social enterprises. Mm -hmm. And that's, a, that's a, you know, a mistake, and that's a, a mistake or a, a problem in the, in the system that can be easily fixed if you want to. So we've gone a long way from the book, <laughs> which, which, which sort of <laughs> fixes our misconceptions or addresses our misconceptions about innovation with a big I and scaling with a big S and just replicating the Silicon Valley model for entrepreneurship in the social sector. Um, we've talked about lots and lots of other pieces of the puzzle and it's gotten a little bit more complex <laughs> and maybe a little bit more daunting for me personally. So just a closing question. 
what message would you have for people who are either embarking on or sustaining their roles as social innovators out here in our audience and in our virtual audience? What's, what makes them, what should give them hope or what might be sources of challenge? Well, my, my piece of advice is always like, don't be discouraged by people uh, who tell you this can never work. You know, uh, I think that's, um, trust your, your gut feeling on that and don't be discouraged because you, everyone finds thousand reasons why this can't work. You know? uh, but then again, uh, you have to try it out. And, and the second is, is don't rely on recipes uh, or textbook solution. Uh, rely on your imagination, on your um, capacity to think and your ability to learn. It's fantastic. And the four archetypes are simply that. They're not recipes, but they're demonstrations of how people learned. So thank you so much. It's been really enjoyable, um, really engaging, and I've learned so much. I hope that the rest of you have. Um, and thank you so much for participating you, in our second annual social innovation lecture on behalf of both Trinity Hall and the Judge Business School Center for Social Innovation. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you for joining us online and here in the audience. Thank Thanks. you. So for those physically present, we do have an opportunity for a drink and a chat outside. So I do hope that you're able to stick around and join us for that. For those virtually present, um, you're here with us in thought. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.